Hello there. So in this video, I'm going to be analysing Christina Rossetti's amazing poem, A Birthday. Now, this poem is quite different from Rossetti's other works. It's a love poem, one that rises and gets more and more passionate as it, as it goes along. But there's a lot going on behind the, the same, behind the scenes. And this is pretty different from other Rossetti poems, as she usually talks about doom and love, lost love or even death. And generally, things don't really end very well with Rossetti in poems. Um, but here we have something totally different. We still have a poem that's very carefully constructed uh, with two octaves, eight lines, but each one does a very different job as we'll see. So firstly, let's, let's listen to the poem and then we'll begin to analyze it. My heart is like a singing bird whose nest is in a watered shoot. My heart is like an apple tree whose boughs are bent with thick set fruit. My heart is like a rainbow shell that paddles in a halcyon sea. My heart is gladder than all these because my love is come to me. Raise me a dais of silken down, hang it with vair and purple dyes, carve it in doves and pomegranates and peacocks with a hundred eyes, work it in gold and silver grapes, in leaves and silver fleur-de-lis, because the birthday of my life is come, my love is come to me. So first up, um, it's always worth looking at a poem's title. This one is a birthday, but clearly there are no signs of cards or cakes here. It's a different kind of birth or maybe rebirth that's going on. So let's take a closer look and find out what she's really talking about. Now, in the first octave, we find the speaker looking for a way to describe her love. She looks to find adequate words to describe her emotions, which is always a challenge for a poet. The repeated phrase, my heart is like, shows the speaker using a simile-like to compare her heart with something. If you want to be fancy, this repeated phrase at the start of a line is called an anaphora. Now, at first, her heart is like a singing bird in a watered shoot, which is a, a branch that's recently grown. Now, this gives us the impression that this love has also just blossomed into life. That doesn't seem to do, though, with her, so she moves on to the next simile, where her love is like an apple tree. Here, the bent boughs, uh, alliteration there as well, suggest a fruit that is ripe and ready to fall. In the same way, her heart is ready to burst with love. Maybe she's also hinting at fertility and families here. But that also doesn't seem to really do the trick for her. So she moves on to comparing her heart to a rainbow or multicolored shell. Here, we seem to get going as the imagery is stronger and paddling in a halcyon sea seems an idyllic, even perfect scene. Paddling is a, a gentle verb that suggests peace and happiness. Halcyon refers to a perfect time, such as when her love has come, but it's also a kind of bird, a kingfisher, and we'll hold up to that thought and the idea of kings, because maybe Rossetti is very subtly foreshadowing something that's going to happen later. But even after all this, in the next line, she appears to give up on it and reveals that none of these work. The speaker uses the comparative, my heart is gladder, to show that none of these similes truly reflect how she feels. Note also here that the images are all connected or have a semantic field to do with nature, birds, apples, and rainbows. So maybe she's right. Can the imagery used here really reflect how we feel when we're in love or when our lovers come to us, or are they just poor imitations at actual emotion? Well, whichever it is, Rossetti isn't about to give up trying to find a way to share this feeling. And so we march on to the second stanza or octave, where she has a, a new plan. Gone are those similes, uh, which we know aren't as powerful as metaphor. Instead, look at the first words of the first three lines to start with. What do you notice about raise, hang and carve? Well, yeah, they're all verbs. And when we start a line or sentence with a verb like this, it sounds commanding and powerful. And to be super technical, these are base verbs or infinit infinitive verbs where you don't stick ed or ing on the end. And when we do this, we can say the writer's using imperatives or imperative verbs. So we kick off with creating a dais or platform of silk and down that's hung with ver, and that's squirrel fur to you and me, and purple clothes. Now, there's a lot going on with the imagery here, so let's let's take a look. A, a dais is, is something you would probably see in a throne room or somewhere super important. Hanging it with luxurious items shows 
how, how lavishly she wants to treat her newly arrived love. And why purple? Well, back then, purple was one of the more expensive dyes, so it was often reserved for royalty only. And if you remember, there was an allusion earlier to, to kings with the kingfisher. The next imperative talks about carving doves and fruit or pomegranates, then peacocks with a hundred eyes, a reference to their feathers. But this also gives the impression she wants her love to have an audience and really know how special, um, how special it is. Another imperative follows as she demands gold and silver grapes, work it in gold and silver grapes. And also a fleur-de-lis or a lily emblem that represents purity. Now there's a lot of symbolism going on here as each of these items can represent something else, mostly connected to royalty or something very precious and special. So let's pause here for a moment and think what else is different from the first octave. Okay, so we saw how we move from the anaphora of my heart is like and similes to the imperatives of the second octave. Do you notice anything else about the imagery used here? Well, in the first octave, she talks about the semantic field of nature. In the second part, she still talks about fruits and flowers, but this time they're carved or sculpted. Now, why would she do that? So let's think about this. If we have ripe apples or singing birds, they look and sound lovely, but not for very long. The apple will soon go bad and the bird won't be around forever. And if we think about this, we can start to see maybe why Rossetti doesn't fancy them and tries a different strategy. These images of nature in the second part are carved and are far more long lasting. And she wants a more permanent, permanent sorry, representation of her love. So this works much better for her. She goes from being quite inward looking at the start to being far more powerful and confident in tone. And it's important to understand and appreciate this change. As we near the end, we finally see what the title is about. The speaker needs these things because she feels her love has suddenly begun and her love has come. By this point, you may well be thinking, well, that's great for her, but who is this love? When Rossetti wrote this at the end of 1857, she wasn't actually in a relationship. In fact, she never married at all. The poems written right before and after this also are pretty downbeat and grim. Uh, one line in one of them even says, my heart dies inch by inch, really cheery stuff. So maybe she just took a break from all that doom and gloom by imagining what a real lasting love would be like. Another option is that this love is God, um, which would explain why it's so powerful and, and permanent. But that also seems a little less likely because Rossetti didn't list it alongside the many, many other religious poems she did write. And maybe it doesn't matter. It's, it's up to us to feel the sense of love and devotion in the poem rather than wonder who the poet was thinking of. And was, let's talk about the form or structure a little now. It's also really important. The one wonderful thing about this poem is the sense of rhythm and how gorgeous it sounds. It flows so well. It's almost like a song and it bounces along at the start with the iambic rhythm of my heart is like a singing bird. And iambic is when the, the first syllable is unstressed and the second syllable, second syllable is stressed, a bit like a heartbeat. This makes it sound natural, but also gives the line extra pace and a sense of urgency. Then there's all that alliteration of pomegranates and peacocks or gold and grapes. And, and note also how these are kind of harder sounds that reflect the, the growing confidence uh, of the second octave. Compare that with the softer S sounds or, or sibilants nearer the start, shoot, halcyon, sea and, and shell. So overall, this poem is famed for its passion towards an arriving love and the way it changes from being inward looking to being majestic, confident, and almost over the top in the way it celebrates um, and, and how this ex excitement builds and builds. The fact we have no idea who this love is, and indeed, if it was even a real love for Rossetti, makes it all the more intriguing. Thank you very much. Hope you liked that. Feel free to like and subscribe.